This is Of Thee We Sing, a look at music and its role in the early years of civil rights. I'm Jean Cochran. In this segment, a voice that shook the nation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're speaking to you from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in the nation's capital. From which point? In 1939, in Washington, D.C., blacks couldn't go to the same schools as whites. African Americans weren't allowed to eat in restaurants downtown. If an African American man walked into a clothing store, he wasn't allowed to try on clothes. African American women were not allowed to try on hats. Yet on Sunday, April 9th, 1939, a huge mixed race crowd gathered at the Lincoln Memorial. 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. They came to hear a concert of classical music. And according to University of South Florida professor Raymond Arsenault, This was unprecedented. The National Broadcasting Company brings you a song recital by the gifted Marian Anderson. Considered unprecedented for a number of reasons. First, there'd never been a crowd this big at the Lincoln Memorial before, even when it was dedicated 17 years earlier. We have an official announcement of the attendance. The United States Park Police officially estimate the attendance at over 75,000. A crowd this big for an outdoor classical music concert was also unprecedented in the United States. But most unprecedented of all was the woman they'd all come to hear. There, in front of that enormous crowd, was a 42-year-old African-American singer named Marian Anderson. The Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture has the dress that Marian Anderson wore that day. It is that important to the history of civil rights and to American history. One of the people who helped get the dress was museum curator Dr. Dwandalyn Reese. It was amazing to me that these 75,000 people gathered in 1939, some probably out of curiosity, but also in solidarity of racial equality. Marian Anderson is singing this public concert at the Lincoln Memorial because she was unable to get an auditorium to accommodate the tremendous audience that wished to hear her. For white people, including the ones who came out in racial solidarity, this concert didn't start out to be this big. And it didn't start out to be about equal rights. It hadn't started out that way for Marian Anderson either. According to Dr. Arsenault, where it started was with Marian Anderson's manager looking for a place big enough for her to sing. She was touring all over the United States. She was filling the largest concert halls in the nation, sometimes five and 6,000 people. In the middle of March 1939, the annual music series at Howard University invited Ms. Anderson to come to Washington and sing. The problem was, Washington didn't have a lot of big theaters or concert halls in those days. The only place that even came close was Constitution Hall near the Washington Monument. It was run by the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. But while white people weren't out to make a point with this concert, Dr. Reese says that wasn't the case for leaders of Washington, D.C.'s African-American community. The whole event, instead of being this random occurrence that just happened and we made it into this civil rights moment, it was much more strategic. This was not the first time Howard University had invited Marian Anderson to sing in the city. It also wasn't the first time they'd asked the DAR to use Constitution Hall. Every other time, the DAR had turned them down. Constitution Hall was segregated. No black people were allowed to go in there, and they certainly weren't allowed to sing on the stage. Knowing the policies of the DAR and Constitution Hall, they strategically approached them once again to see if she could perform there. In the past, Dr. Reese says, when the DAR had said no, Howard University officials had gone away quietly. This time, 
the response was different. About the only other place that would hold a big enough crowd was the auditorium at the city's Central High School, which, as Dr. Arsenault points out, was... The largest white high school in the District of Columbia. White high school. Washington was a segregated city in 1939. Black and white students went to different schools. To get Central High School Auditorium for the concert, the Howard University organizers had to ask permission from the city school board. And again, Dr. Reese says, just as they did with Constitution Hall, they walked into the negotiation with a strategy. What they wanted was to look at the local schools and integrating the schools and the facilities for African Americans. What they seemed to be trying to do was to make inroads that were going to hold fast, not just a one-shot deal and then just go back to business as usual. The school board knew what they were doing, so they said yes. But Dr. Arsenault says they put so many conditions on it. In other words, they made the offer, but they didn't. They knew that the Howard University was going to turn it down. And they did. So now what? Marian Anderson was coming to town. The concert was planned. People bought tickets, but there was no place to hold the concert. Miss Anderson will be introduced by Secretary of the Interior, Harold L. Ickes, after which she will sing a group of three songs. Of all people, in walked the Secretary of the Interior, a man named Harold Ickes. Mr. Ickes believed in racial equality at a time when most white Americans didn't. And he had an important person working with him, the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. When the DAR turned Howard University down, Mrs. Roosevelt, who was a member of the DAR, said she was outraged. She was quitting. Well, that got a lot of attention, and Harold Ickes had an idea that would generate even more. He knew a place that would hold all the people who wanted to show up. Hold the concert, he said, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. In this great auditorium under the sky, all of us are free. When God gave us this wonderful outdoors and the sun the moon and the stars, he made no distinction of race or creed or color. Holding the concert outside was a fantastic idea. Everyone agreed. Everyone, that is, except Marian Anderson. She was very hesitant to sing. There were a lot of reasons why, Dr. Arsenault says. For one, she had never sung outside before. She was accustomed to classical music halls where the acoustics were very carefully controlled. Another thing, even though the concert was going to be in April, it was going to be cold and possibly snowing. It didn't seem like a very good prospect to her. She was so worried, in fact, that she told her manager that she had decided that she could not go through with it. Abraham Lincoln laid down his life, and so it is as appropriate as it is fortunate that today we stand reverently and humbly at the base of this memorial to the great emancipator while glorious tribute is rendered to his memory by a daughter of the race from which he struck the chains of slavery. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall fanned a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. As we all know now, Marian Anderson overcame her fear and the concert did go on. Just one more hurdle that Marian Anderson had to overcome in her life. She was forced to go up the freight elevators in the hotels and to eat alone in her room because she knew she wasn't welcome in the hotel dining room. There were lots and lots of those slights, and she bore them with great dignity. It was something she had learned during the course of a very difficult childhood. Born of humble parents in Philadelphia's Negro Quarter, she lived as a child in a single rented room with her two sisters and her parents. When she was a young girl, her father died, and her mother would scrub floors at Wanamaker's department store. Marian Anderson had to drop out of school. She didn't graduate from high school till she was 24 years old. She sang in church when she was growing up in Philadelphia and got people's attention. At the age of eight, she was called the baby contralto and won her first fee, 50 cents. Being African-American, though, when she decided she liked classical music, she found she couldn't get formal training at music schools. They turned her away. Dr. Arsenault says she was told, You don't have the right color skin to train at this school. Fortunately, she found a white teacher who took a chance on her. Giuseppe Boghetti, who took a chance on her and he became her 
tutor and sponsored her in competitions in New York. She started her music career latching on originally to a man named Roland Hayes, who was a great black singer in the early part of the 20th century. Roland Hayes was one of the first black singers to break out of the stereotype of just singing Negro folk songs. He sang German later. That's what she wanted to do. Marian Anderson found she couldn't get work in America, so she moved to Europe, where she became an enormous star. There, Dr. Reese says, she not only did the German leader, the Italian arias, so she was doing Russian and Finnish folk songs, so she was really stretching her repertoire and showing what an artist could be. It was extremely important at this time that Marian Anderson was able to succeed. As Dr. Arsenault points out, there were plenty of people in this country who thought that classical music was something that was just too difficult for African Americans to master. Part of the stereotyping of blacks was to say that they were good dancers, and they were musical, and they were good singers. But it was all done in a notion that it was the kind of singing that didn't take discipline. It wasn't something that you studied. It was something that you did naturally. Anderson becoming a star showed that stereotype to be wrong. By being such a success, Dr. Reese says she showed that African Americans can excel in this area too, so we're not limited to singing just the spirituals. This was a time, remember, when all across the country, African Americans were not allowed to use the same toilet as white people. So Marian Anderson standing up on the great stages of Europe and singing classical music, and Marian Anderson standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, beside the statue of the president who'd freed the slaves, it made her a symbol, though Dr. Reese says. Marian Anderson was kind of a reluctant symbol. But at a time when most whites thought blacks just couldn't measure up, she was an important symbol because of how she achieved her success. Just by being good at her craft, that's all she was doing. She was being excellent in her craft, took what she did seriously, and did it well. In 1939, when Marian Anderson sang at the Lincoln Memorial, the great battles of the civil rights movement were still many years off. It would be a long time before blacks could vote, serve on juries, be elected mayor, or serve on a police force. And to get there would take many struggles, some of them violent. But according to Dr. Reese, Marian Anderson's concert should be seen as equal, just as important as any civil rights action that followed it. 
When we talk about civil rights movement, we really kind of focus on the 50s and 60s. It didn't just kind of blossom up and come out out of nowhere. The people who came first, like Marian Anderson, paved the way and even inspired the civil rights heroes who are better known. That activism, it just doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's times when Martin Luther King has spoken of that concert at the Lincoln Memorial. The road to equality was a long one, Dr. Reese says. This fight did not just start at one point. The battle for equality had many heroes. Some of them made history just by opening their mouths to sing. Thanks for listening. I'm Jean Cochran for Arts Edge, an education program of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts.